Hello, everyone. I'm very excited today to introduce you to Ellen Wang, who is a WFM, and she is also a medalist. She medaled for the United States team when playing a tournament in Brazil. She got a bronze medal, and she is also just 12 years old, but she was one of the members of this great group of girls called the Unruly Queens, and they got second place in the U.S. Amateur Team East, a really competitive tournament, and they actually scored a lot of upsets in their last round. So um, also something that's really relevant, especially to the topic today, is that Ellen and her friends from Unruly Queens organized a Blitz chess tournament on chess.com a week ago that raised thousands of dollars for COVID-19 relief. So Ellen, I'm very excited to have you here um, to say Hello to everybody, and also to show us this awesome fragment from one of your games. Yeah, so thank you, Jennifer. And um, so, yeah, as Jennifer said, I'm WFM Ellen Wang, and um, I was part of the Unruly Queens U.S. Amateur Team East uh, team, and um, we got second place overall, as well as the top New York State team, the top Scholastic team, and also the top um, female team. And it was also like an unprecedented um, like finish by an all-girls team because an all-girls team has never finished so high in the standings at the U.S. Amateur Team East. So we were really proud of that and we were hoping that we could inspire young girls to play chess all over the world because chess is really just an incredible game that, you know, we, you can make new friends, you could connect with other people. And it's just, there's just so many things that are so fun about it. and. Um, you just you get to learn so much from it. So I'm going to be showing a game from the World Cadets Chess Championship in 2017. So this was the tournament that um, I won bronze at, and this was one of the key rounds where um, I played a very tough opponent from Vietnam, and it was a really crucial game. So um, this game was round six, and it was the round after the rest day. So on the rest day, I had went to this really big carnival, um, which was, it was really fun. I went with my friend and I like to, one of the things that I like to do um, during a very big tournament like this is clear my mind and um, especially before such a crucial game because I had four out of five, um, four points out of five games um, going into this round, which was a pretty good score. Um, but if I wanted to make a big leap onto the leaderboard, I had to um, win this game and I definitely could not lose this game. So um, I'm going to be showing um, a position from this game because I think that it was very crucial. And um, so it was this position from move number, um, before, right before move number 31. And as you can see, I kind of messed up um, the first half of the game because um, White's pawns on the queen side are under very heavy pressure. Um, this pawn on b2 is backwards, and um, like, which means that no other pawns can defend it. And the pawn on a4 is also um, under some very heavy pressure because the rook on b4 is attacking it. And there is really no good way to defend. So in this moment, I was thinking, um, you know, how can I create some um, complications? Because um, this is also move number 31, and we both had around like 10 to 11 minutes, and the time control for this tournament was that you get 90 minutes for 40 moves, and once you hit 40 moves, you get another 30 minutes with a 30 second increment. So I knew that we were both trying to get to move number 40 as quickly as possible, um, but I knew that if I wanted to make some complications, it would really be in my favor because she would not have too much time to think about what to do or how to deal with it. So I took that into account in making my decision as well. And I thought about, you know, what is good about my position and what weaknesses does black have? Because this is one of the golden rules in chess. So you always wanna play where you are the strongest. You'd never wanna play where your opponent has strengths because they will always overpower you. So here you can see that almost all of black's pieces are on the queen side, um, the queen and the two rooks. And only the black bishop is on the king side defending. And you can see that this g6 square, if my queen could land on this g6 square, um, then I will definitely um, be maybe even winning because the king would be forced to move out and then the h6 pawn would fall. 
and only the F7 pawn is defending this G6 square right now. So I was thinking, you know, if I could get my queen to G6, that would just be amazing because um, I, I, I think I'm losing in this position and if I could somehow get this, then that would be a big turnaround in the game. So I started thinking in this position how I could create some complications on the king side. And then I came up with a move that immediately when I saw this move, I was like, oh, this move, it has to be correct because, you know, it just has so many strong points. And considering the situation, my opponent would not have too much time to think. So the move that I played in this position was the move rook to e6. Um, so um, when we first look at this move, um, it's not so obvious because the, we see that the pawn on f7 is defending this e6 square. And the first thing we should ask ourselves is what happens if black just takes the rook? So if black takes the rook, um, this is where the key g6 square comes into play because the queen can go to g6 and the king is forced to move to either f8 or to h8. So first we'll look at what happens if the king goes to f8. So now we can play this move d takes e6, and we can see that there is just no way to stop queen f7 checkmate. And you see that this dark squared bishop on f6 just can do nothing to defend because it's a dark squared bishop and um, we are attacking on the light squares. So none of these pieces on the queen side can help either because black is just too slow. So that's why black cannot play king to f8 if um, f takes e6 were to happen. So now we're go we'll go back to this, the, um, the position where after white played queen g6. And we'll, let's talk about what happens if black plays king to h8. So after king to h8, um, we're going to play queen takes h6, check and black is forced to play king to g8. So here there is no way for white to checkmate, but I can just go back to g6. And um, black cannot play bishop to g7 to defend because of the move h6. And we see that this bishop is pinned, and whenever we have a pinned piece, we want to put extra pressure on it. And a pawn is the perfect, is the perfect attacker because there is nothing that has less value than a pawn. But in this case, black just cannot defend because we see that if the queen tries to defend the bishop via queen d4, then the rook can just take the queen and there is still no way to stop queen takes g7, which is checkmate. So bishop g7 cannot be played. So after queen to g6 check, black still cannot go king f8 because of d takes e6 and f7 is still undefended. So queen to g6, black would be forced to go back king h8, and then I would go back queen h6, and this will eventually lead to a threefold repetition um, draw. And a draw was a pretty good um, result for me because I knew that, you know, if I had passively defended and tried to hold my queen side together, I would just lose pawns, likely the b2 pawn and the a4 pawn, and I would just lose the game. So I thought that a draw is a pretty good result. And um, so my opponent did not end up playing f takes e6 for this reason. And um, after rook e6, the computer says that rook d4 is still winning for black, but this is not an easy move to find, especially under the psychological um, thing, uh, the psychological pressure after seeing your opponent play a move like rookie six, which she definitely did not consider because I saw her face just um, like drop and because I knew that we were both thinking that, you know, I was doomed and I would not be able to save this game. But after rookie six, the psychological pressure just, um, she just cracked and I don't blame her because I knew, I know that, you know, if I had been in this situation, I definitely would have cracked too because Seeing your opponent play just slam down rookie six is just, it's really hard to see. And you're just thinking, you know, how do I save my position? So she definitely did not want a draw with f takes e6 because of the pressure here on the queen side. So she played the move bishop takes b2, um, taking the pawn. So here um, I had seen this move after I played rookie six, and I was, um, I had prepared for this move. So now we have another tactic. So I put the move rook takes h6. And we see that this is also not an obvious move to see because the king is just defending the h6 square. But if we look closer, if king takes h6, white can play the move queen takes f7 because the king is no longer defending this f7 square. And black just 
again, has no way to defend against checkmate on g6, because this dark squared bishop, which is the only defender of black's kingside, just cannot do anything, because bishops only move along one color, and I am attacking along the light squares. So that is why king takes h6 cannot be played. And at this point, I think white is already winning, but um, there's just black cannot defend because queen h7 is coming, rook h7 is coming, and with along with queen takes f7 checkmate. So if she had just played a move like, I don't know, like queen b8, which seems reasonable, maybe the queen can come back along the eighth rank, it's just too slow because rook h7 check, and if the king goes to g8 or f8, then just queen takes f7 is checkmate. So she had to defend against this threat of rook h7 and queen takes f7. So she put the move bishop to f6, which is a really reasonable move because now after rook h7, the king can just move back to f8 or g8 and there's no queen takes f7 checkmate anymore. So I began to look for more tactics. And after bishop to f6, um, I saw that I could play this move queen h7. But then after king f8, I had to think again because this bishop is now doing a very nice job of defending these squares g7 and h8 because my queen would love to go to h8, which would be checkmate if the bishop were not here. So um, I was thinking, you know, if I could get my queen to h8, that would be checkmate. So I started to think of ways to get this bishop away. Now we have no way to really attack the bishop with anything like a pawn, but we see that this rook is already eyeing the bishop on f6. So what happens if we just take the bishop? Well, black will, black will take, on, take the rook on f6 because the pawn is defending the bishop, but we see that white just has checkmate after queen h8, king e7, rook e1, king d7, and queen e8 checkmate. So this was my plan all along after playing rook takes h6 and bishop f6. So here, queen h7, king f8, and I played the move rook takes f6, and here it's already losing because Black cannot take the rook back, and therefore black is just down a piece, and the king is still not at all safe. So black played king e8, and after queen takes f7, king d8, queen g8, king d7, queen e6, king e8, and rook g6, black has no way to stop rook g8 checkmate, so she just resigned. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love it. Great, great fragment. This is so such a perfect pick, Ellen. Um, yeah, fantastic. And I, I like the defensive move, rook d4, too. So hard to see. Um, but I, I think that uh, it's just a really great example of being tricky and resilient, even when you're not in a great position. Uh, and you ended up, because of this win, you ended up getting the bronze medal, or just it was a crucial po point in the tournament? Yeah, it was a crucial point because it's like the midway point. Mm -hmm. And there were, I had four points out of five. And there were like a few people, I think there was one person with a perfect score and like maybe two people with four and a half and then a few people tied with me for, with four points. So if I wanted to like keep staying on top, I had to either win or at least draw the game. So yeah, this was a very crucial round. Great. And you, these ratings, by the way, are a little deflated because they're FIDE ratings and sometimes like young people, because I think this player is probably high, better than 1400 based on this, these, this position she achieved. Um, yeah. yeah. And tell us you're going to do more unruly queen events as well, right? Because you raised a lot of money for COVID-19 and we can continue to follow more about unruly queens where? Yeah, so um, we, we have created a Facebook page, so um, you can follow our Facebook page. I'm not really sure what it is, but um, I can send it to you, Jennifer, after um, this, and then, I, and then you can send it to the participants from the seminar. And we will be hosting more just like standard chess blitz or rapid events. And we'll also have like a few like fun events like Bug House or like Crazy House, stuff like that that's fun for um, you guys to, you know, get to know your partners and stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll have a lot of fun events like that in the future with streaming. And, um, you know, I think it's great that, you know, young girls are inspired to play chess. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. You're great. You're really good at this.